would like to welcome you to another edition of It's Time for a Change. You know, a lot of times people come up to me and give me suggestions for shows or have a great idea for me to interview somebody, and, and I really listen. But this time, one of my good friends, Joni Anderson, told me about a Rockfordian named Tom Zuba, who had a story to tell. I called him up, and uh, we had a nice conversation. And he's my guest today. I'd like to welcome Tom Zuba. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here. Nice to have you here. You've been in the media. I've heard you on the radio lately. You really have a story to tell. I do. I do. <laughs> so I felt it was appropriate. You know, the holidays are so tough for people. Um, I feel it was appropriate that we wait and this show air around the holiday season. We talk about things that affect all of us at some point in time. But uh, you've been through it, and I've recently been through a lot of grief, a lot of yeah. pain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, why don't you tell my viewers a little bit about you, and then tell my viewers your story and how it happened to you. Okay, uh, really, really briefly. Okay. Um, in 1990, uh, my wife and I were married, recently married, had an 18-month-old daughter. Life was spectacular. I mean, we were happy living in Oak Park. And very suddenly, our 18-month-old daughter, Erin, got sick, um, took her to the hospital. W we were transferred to Rush Press uh, right there on the Eisenhower, and she died. Uh, she died after about a five-day uh, journey. Um, she died from something called hemolytic uremic syndrome. We, we didn't even know what that was. Um, we went on and uh, you know, pulled our life back together, um, dreamed some new dreams. We had two kids, uh, a son, Rory, and a son, Sean. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple days after Christmas of 1998, my wife turns to me and asks me to take her pulse. Uh, telling me she feels like her pulse is racing. Before I know it, I'm calling 911. We're both in the ambulance. 52 hours later, on New Year's Day, she's dead. Um, what was remarkable to me is that the next day would have been our daughter's 10th birthday. So I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old staring at me. You know, what are we going to do now, Daddy? Uh, my wife was my best friend. My wife was my business partner. What was her name? Trish. 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 Uh, thanks for asking me. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important that we get to say their names. Mm -hmm. um, and believe it or not, I, I, it, took me, it took me a good number of years. Um, but I moved to Northern California. I got my feet back on the ground. I felt pretty happy. My kids were pretty happy. We moved back to Rockford. I enrolled them in the Rockford Public Schools. This is my home. I have a huge family. We're surrounded by family. My son was in the gifted program. My son, Rory, was 13. He had a great summer. He told me, Dad, I can't wait to get back to school because I can't wait until the teachers find out how smart I am. <laughs> so he went to school for two days, had a seizure in the middle of the night. I'm in the ambulance again, going to Rockford Memorial. But a six-month journey. He was misdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. We were in Rockford, we were in Chicago. Uh, finally, in November, he had a brain biopsy, which resulted in removal of his left temporal lobe. Now, this was a brilliant kid. They took out his whole left temporal lobe. And I was told he had brain cancer. And it was a type of brain cancer that had no cure. So that was in November, and on February 22nd, 2005, he died. So I am living with the death of my firstborn, my daughter Erin, my wife Trish, my son Rory. And uh, I have a son now at Guilford, 15-year-old son Sean, and it's Sean and I. And over the last 20 years, uh, my goal was to become an expert on my own grief. Um, and one of the things that has really, really helped me heal is I want to help other people. I've learned a tremendous amount. That is really contrary to a lot of 
that the experts out there are saying. Right. And, and I want to share it. I, I want to help people um, learn how to live. Believe it or not, I want to help people learn how to live full, happy, joy-filled lives because I think it's possible. Well, you know, I, I think it was in early September, Joni Anderson called me. We worked at FedEx for way over 20 years. I retired from there. And, and Joni said, you got to meet this guy named Tom Zuba. And uh, she had told me earlier, but she called me again and said, did you call him? Did you get a chance? And I said, Joni, I did, but I'm going to call him. And when I uh, finally got in contact with you, um, you know, I had to tell you about I lost my son. Exactly. Uh, this year, uh, July the 10th. Um, as far as we know, seizure was one of the causes of it. And uh, it's just really been painful. But one thing me and my wife learned in the death of our son, there's a lot of other people that feel that same pain that we feel. And I can't account for anybody else's feelings, but I know if you love somebody, it's just like, it's very painful to think about. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the things that happened after my daughter died, I started reading the obituaries. Do, do you check out the I've obituaries? I've always read them. I've always read them before my son died, before my dad died. I've always read them. Well, what's amazing to me, Tommy, is, mm -hmm. I mean, we know this, but, yeah. but we don't think about it. People are dying every, every day. day. You know, people's husbands, people's wives, people's children, people's parents. Mm -hmm. Yet, we are so ill-equipped and so ill-prepared it's like, why, why don't we know more about how to, how to live with the experience? Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you. It's like, the way I describe it is, it's like someone took a really dull shovel, dug out my heart, and I, I kept living. Yeah. Or there was a grenade put on my heart, it exploded, and I'm supposed to function. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I tell you, I, I, I know what you mean, but you know, one thing you said about the obituaries, I've always had a, a habit of reading them. I got a good friend I work with named Bobby Williams. I hope he don't get mad at me mentioning it. But that's what he does every day, and I try to do it every day. And I, I really started years ago. I had some problems, you know, in my life. And um, I kind of got away from a lot of things I should have taken care of. I had drug issues. and I've been out of that world for 21 and a half years. But a good friend of mine's father died when I was in the midst of that, uh, Tim Demke. Uh, we were high school teammates, college teammates, and his father, that first year of school, his father used to take us back and forth to school, him and Gerald Bell and I, and uh, Mr. Demke was just one of the best human beings you ever want to meet. Hmm. He passed away. And I was reading obituaries, and I know Tim was probably so distraught at the time he didn't call me. Because I can understand that, you know, going through, it was kind of sudden, I think. Yeah. And I didn't read the obituaries, and I was reading, I was working one day, I just happened to read the obituaries, and I was stuck at work for FedEx. You just can't leave. Your responsibility is too vast. And I saw Mr. Demke was being buried that night. And I wasn't going to get off work till 8 o'clock. It was one of the worst feelings that I've had, not being able to go by and show my respect. So yeah. your analogy about reading obituaries and my constant reading of them, I think it's a good thing for people to do. I do, too. I do, too. Are you now, um, after your son's death, like particularly drawn to young people that die? or, or have you always been? I've always looked. I've always looked to see if there's people that I know. Um, you know, it's just, it's just kind of thing I always did. And then when it happened to my son, it was just so bizarre. Yeah. Um, and didn't you appreciate everyone that came, you know, to, to show their respects? Oh, man. 